uh, a very good afternoon or good evening as a case may be to all of you. Welcome, Professor John Jero to IIT Delhi. <laughs> it's not me, this is the first ever visit to the Institute. You have been in Singapore and Delhi and India on, on multiple locations before. Right. And I would also like to extend the welcome uh, to all the faculty colleagues, students, project and research staff from IIT Delhi. From outside IIT Delhi, I've told a sizable number of students from Delhi University and many other universities in the NCR have come for this lecture. I have known Professor Jim for close to a decade and a half. And I have been fortunate enough on multiple occasions to speak on a variety of topics. And so the show that they want to follow, I'm not sure if that would do justice. To his expertise. Now, here is a short introduction of Professor Chiro. Professor Chiro is a research professor in computer science and architecture at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. He is a former professor of design science and director of the key center of design, computing, and cognition at the University of Sydney. He has been a visiting professor of design and computation, architecture. Mechanical engineering, civil engineering, artificial intelligence, cognitive psychology, computer science, and computation, computation social science at MIT, Columbia University, UC Berkeley, UC at Los Angeles, Columbia University, INSA in Bay, University of Stockholm, EPFM, University of Providence, and the Job Racing University. He has been an author, audio editor, and close to around 60 books, and has published around 800 research papers. And to his credit, he has over 30,000 citations. I can go on now, but I'll stop and hand over the podium to Professor Bajit. Thank you. I've got to say, when I saw half a dozen people stand up and leave, I thought, what did they know that I didn't know? And it turned out they were going higher up. I understand there's a charge for being higher up. That will come later. Okay, firstly, I'm truly pleased to be here. When I first came to Delhi in 1973, and nobody ever invited me here, and I don't know why. So I am delighted to be here. What I want to do over the next 45 minutes or so is to introduce you to some things that perhaps as designers and some of you as design researchers, you don't come across too often. As humans, we have this really amazing ability to produce things, but we can't really get a handle on how we do it because we have great difficulty looking inside our minds. In fact, it's very hard to look inside your mind. In fact, there's some might even claim that there's no such thing as a mind. And it's much harder to look inside your brain because we have no senses to this. But we live in a world where now it's possible to find out things that you can't see, feel, or touch. And we're familiar with this. Anyone who uses a phone, and one should be careful about reading headlines today, I'll leave it that way. Um, when you use a phone, you know that all the communication between that device and everything else, you can't see, feel, or touch. But we can measure it, we make use of it. So what I want to do is to introduce you to the way in which we can study designers. Okay. And the first thing is we want to look inside your mind. And there's a field that looks inside people's minds called cognitive science. 
So we're going to call that design cognition, looking inside the mind. And lo and behold, if you want to look inside a person's brain, while they're doing cognitive acts, we call that neurocognition. So how do we do this? Well, we need to be able to measure. Well, I'm going to use the word measure many times, and everything I do is about measure. How do we measure thought? The only way we can measure thought, since we can't put our finger in there, is when people externalize, like I'm doing now. The expectation is that when you externalize thought, or externalize, it's something to do with what's happening in your mind. And we accept that when we talk, what's coming out is some representation of what's in there. So the most common way we externalize is by talking. But there's other ways, and I've listed some here. So what I'm going to do is to measure these ex externalizations. How do we, you can read that, how do we measure the brain? Well, it turns out the brain also externalizes a little bit. As you know, the brain is this amazing organ made up of neurons, about 85 billion of them, and connections between them, untold trillions of connections. And as the brain operates, it does multiple things, and one of them is it generates a small amount of electricity, and that electricity escapes through the skull, and we can measure that. And that's called EEG, electroencephalography. And the assumption is, and there's evidence for this, that thought produces electrical signals, escapes through them. Skull, we measure it we can find out something. We can also look inside. And there's different ways to look inside the brain without sticking something in. People really don't like to have probes stuck inside their brains, which is a bit of a shame because we would know more, but we're not going to do it. And how do we find out what's happening in the brain? <laughs> Well, you can take a course on this, but I'll give you 20 seconds, which will give you one. The brain is made up of cells. All cells require energy to do anything. For the human body, energy is transported through oxygen, and oxygen is moved around through the blood. So if we can measure blood flow, and the oxygen in that, we have a measurement of activation in the brain. And that's what these devices do. The one you're most probably familiar with is MRI or fMRI. You may have seen, and I'll show you a picture of what it's worth later. Um, functional magneto resonance imaging. What that does, and I'm not going to say too much about it, is it pumps a huge magnetic field through your brain and that orients the polarity. Let's just say, without getting into details, with that we can measure blood oxygen levels. FNIRS, functional near infrared spectroscopy, shines a near infrared light which goes nicely through the skull into your brain and measures the reflectance and from that we can also get blood oxygen levels. So we have these non-invasive methods. And what I want to do is to show you the sorts of things we've been able to find. So we're going to start with something which is called fixation. What fixation is when you get stuck inappropriately. Why is this interesting to designers? Because designers are very precedent-oriented. That's the way we teach design. 
not, by the way, that innovation is taught. Innovation is taught the opposite way. But design is taught through precedent. And we give you pictures of things. And it turns out that as we show you these, you get stuck on them. Sometimes appropriately and sometimes inappropriately. So here, here's an experiment. We say we want you to design a device. It doesn't really matter what it is. In this case, it's a device that takes someone with low mobility in and out of a bath. One group, we just say, that's what we want. Give you text. And then we look at what you produce. The second group, we give you the same text and then show you a picture and say, this is the level of detail we want. The picture happens to be this one. And what's interesting here is that some of these are reasonable ideas. Some of them are bad ideas. You, that handle there can't be moved because there's no opposing force. And some of them are irrelevant. And it turns out that affects what you do. How many people, are there any mechanical engineers in the audience? Okay, a very small number. Okay, so that only a small number will be offended then. Um, <laughs> the others will be offended later, don't worry. <laughs> so, let, I don't want to go into the detail of it, but simply to say that there's huge fixation effects. By how, how many architects here? A larger number, good, because you're like mechanical engineers. By the way, I know you don't like to hear that, but not of the mechanical engineers. Um, industrial designers or product designers are really, really, really different. Product designers, and you know, don't get too engrossed with the numbers here, have almost the opposite effect. When they see something, they're not going to do that. So they, this is an amazing thing to find. Because if you take people off the street, they all look like this. So now we have some inkling that something's happening in people's minds that are really different depending on their education. Well, so much for high tech. Let me use my low tech finger. <laughs> All right. So let's, that was without words. This was just behavior, how people do things. The field that deals with capturing knowledge from listening to people is called protocol analysis. And you can read all this stuff. It's a well-developed field and it generates information and then knowledge from verbal utterances. You know, there, there's the way we do it. From that, we can gain amazing insight. Another, be optimistic. Press this. Nope. Um, so, for example, if I take everything that a designer says and divide it, into they're either talking about the problem or the solution, that gives me an idea of the distribution across a design session of their mental activity. Very simple. It's a binary coding scheme. Uh, just by the way, this is a Japanese team doing product service design if it makes any difference to you. You can produce a much richer coding scheme if you use a design ontology. So what is an ontology? If you look up ontology, I mean, obviously it's a Greek word. It's got ology, which is the study of. It's the study of ons, whatever ons are. Um, but if you look up ontology, you won't get what I want it to mean. This meaning was invented in the 80s. 
in computer science, an ontology is the framework for knowledge in a field. It's the framework for knowledge. And in design, I'm suggesting there's a very clean ontology. And it's got three ontological categories, function or purpose. What is the purpose of something? Now, the second is the behavior. How does it do things? Now, what's interesting here, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but just tickle you a little bit. Behavior is derivable from the thing, but function isn't. The purpose of something is an attribution, and the behavior is a derivation, and the thing is described by its structure. So this is the function behavior structure ontology. And I'm going to use that to code things, um, these protocols, right? And then I'm going to add codings for requirements and description, which can be represented in function behavior structure. But the interesting thing here is to look at the generic story. All right? So here I'm doing a study where I'm asking designers to brainstorm or to use a technique, a morphological analysis in this case. If you don't know what it is, you should complain to your professors, because you should know what it is. And but what we see here, and this is the important thing, is that this kind of tool, thinking tool, changes the way you work. And we can measure that change. And we can be numerically explicit about the effect of that change. And we can do this all over the place. Ha, ah, it works again. Uh, what is this? This is a study of mechanical engineers when they arrive in their freshman year before they specialize and then as they specialize to become ME of designers and EMR people who specialize in engineering mechanics and what we're plotting here is how their cognition changes due to their education and again, let's not worry too much about the specifics here, because you can go to papers and find all that out. But rather the fact that it's possible now to measure changes in your cognition, in this case due to education. I mean, the interesting ones are clearly here that people who get taught design shift their cognitive effort to think more about the purpose of the things compared to the guys who do um, mechanics. And not surprisingly, the guys who do mechanics shift their effort into determining behavior. Now this is, if you're a professor, this is really good to see because what it says is you have an effect. If there was no effect, we, we would to show this to students. Okay. But then we see all sorts of things. So here's uh, a study of teams. There's three class, three groups of teams, mechanical engineers, industrial designers, and combined teams. And what we're measuring on the vertical axis is the ratio of cognitive effort put into the problem or the solution, right? So if you put more effort into the problem, the number is, than the solution, the number is higher. If you put more effort into the solution than the problem, the number is lower. And what we see here is mechanical engineers compared to industrial designers or product designers put more effort 
into the solution. <coughs> and the mixed teams are actually in between. This is a well-defined, well-understood task. It's called the coffee maker task. This is work done in Singapore, where the problem there is that apartments are getting smaller, therefore you want all your devices to get smaller. So that the task here is how to make your coffee maker have a smaller footprint. Well understood. And then we give the same people, the same teams, a task they've never come across before. And look at what happens. Mechanical engineers don't change very much as to where they put their design effort, which is measured through this cognitive process. Industrial designers change dramatically. And if you correlate this with the outcomes, the designs produced, what do you think you get? Absolutely. The industrial designers' designs are all rated more highly on almost any scale you want, except utility. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to have to talk to the designer of this. So then we can look more carefully at teams. So this is a, a team in a multi-billion dollar company that's the innovation group, right? consists of seven people, one of whom is uh, an intern. And interestingly enough, in the innovation group, who is the leader? Not a designer. A money person. Right? That's just the way that company works. It does quite well if you can get to be a multi-billion dollar company by accident. What I'm interested here, and what we were able to extract is What's the interaction of ideas in this team? Not who talks a lot or a little, but the interaction of ideas. So what's on this graph? The names of the people, it's not their real names, by the way. Um, the size of the node is the number of words spoken. And you shouldn't be surprised, Alan is the team leader. And the arcs represent the probability of that person's idea being taken up by the next person. Right? So if A talks and B takes up the idea, that adds to the probability. And then I've made solid the highest probability. That is, who is going to take up your idea? What's the, the most? And what do you see here? Everyone talks about their own ideas the most. Right? This is not some fake experiment. This is us. We just put four security cameras in the ceiling and walked away and came back. Right? There's a lot to be learned by studying people's minds. Or here's another idea. When we talk, as we design, I can distinguish, and you can too, and I have a computer that does it. Anyway, um, between the first time you bring an idea in to the discussion, and then times you use it again. Right? And I gave it a very sophisticated name, first occurrence. Right? 
Why not? Ever. <laughs> so here's, and we're using it. This is a project I have in Israel, which I think is still running, um, as it was two days ago. Um, where we're looking at design crits. This happens to be architecture. And what we're interested in is to see whether there's a change in student engagement as we move from desktop to VR. And the way we're measuring engagement is by looking at who's introducing ideas. Is it the tutor or the student? So that's, that's the experiment. And it's what's called the natural experiment. We didn't do anything as part of what's going on. They just gave us all the data. Right. So there's no, nothing that we did that could possibly have affected this. On the left is desktop. And the light shaded area at the top is the student introducing ideas and the dark is the tutor and across the bottom are different crits. The right hand side is exactly the same but now in VR. And what we see is, and again there's good statistics behind this, a dramatic shift in student engagement. And <laughs> you can say, well of course the professor doesn't know much about VR compared to a student. The professor here designed, implemented the system, very unusual for an architect to be able to do that. She did all that. So she really knows the system. So here we've been able to see what's the effect of changing the teaching pedagogy. Okay, here's a somewhat larger scale. This is 54 professional engineers. You have to listen to this. Divided into 19 groups of three. That sounds like the beginning of some weird story, but it's not. Um, they're all asked to do the same thing. We should design a, a device of a kind no one has had experience with. So that's what they're doing. Right, so we have 54 designers, 19 teams. And one of the things we're interested in is if we have, and they're divided primarily into mechanical engineers and electronics engineers, is there a lot of collaboration? Because in teams, we always assume there's a lot of collaboration. Although, if you remember our friend, the seven designers, the collaboration isn't as much as you might think. So this is not just one team, but a lot of teams. And what, well, not to get much, there we are. So what is this? This is a real mess. No, it's not. This is every single idea that was mentioned by these 54 designers. And they're turned into what is called a force graph. I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up if you know what a force graph is, because I'll embarrass the professors. Um, what a force graph is, is a graph that takes account of how often the two ideas are mentioned near each other. The more often they are, the more they are towards the middle. The less often they're connected to other ideas, the more they get pushed out. The ones around the edge may have only been mentioned once. Nobody else took them up. The ones in the middle are those where people um, connect to it. The size of the text, which is a little hard to see, is how often those teams mention that idea. So the word people is mentioned by every team. But what I'm interested in is What's the interaction between mechanical engineers and electrical engineers? And the mechanical engineers are pink and the electrical engineers are blue. 
and you can see that they don't interact that much. So a lot of our ideas about collaboration, when we examine them, perhaps are not as clean, because now we have strong evidence that something else is happening, perhaps. Okay, we can take this notion of first occurrence, and here's a team of three designers, different one colour for each designer. And what this shows, this is a force graph so that the ideas in the middle are used more, is that we can see that maybe blue's ideas are used more and reds perhaps the least. We, we can do a little more. So if we now take that and just turn up the third dimension, which is time, we can see that in fact, blue's ideas started earlier. They contributed more and Red's ideas were much later. So this gives us a characterization of a kind we never had before. What's happening to our ideas across time? So let's now, so that gives you a flavor of how you can study the minds of designers. And you know, I'm fortunate enough to have lots and lots of funding and lots and lots of projects all around the world. So I've shown you stuff from um, Singapore, Portugal, the US, Canada, and I think some other places, Israel. Now let's see if we can look inside your brain. And one of the tasks that's, uh, questions that's always interesting is designing, is designing different for problem solving? Well, what do we mean by this, firstly? Problem solving is where everything is sort of well understood. You know what the beginning of a problem is, and more importantly, you know how you'll recognize the answer and how you will evaluate the answer before you start. Whereas designing involves a constructive act, some of which is going to take you to places you didn't know when you started, and there you may need to use criteria that weren't there when you started. So the goal is to see, is your brain different when you do this? So here's the tool, $899 US, I wouldn't do brain science with it, but I'm happy to study designers with it. Um, it goes onto your scale and looks in these locations for electrical signals. Um, here's the task, it's a sort of layout task, which gets progressively, has fewer and fewer constraints. We put them all together on your screen collect all this data and analyze it, and what have we got here? So there's two graphs here. These are radar graphs, spider graphs, whatever you want to call them. Think of it as symmetric. <laughs> Down the middle, it's two halves of the brain. The labels on it are where we were doing the measurements, and the values are the activations, and the colours refer to different tasks. And the interesting ones here are task one, which is the, sort of the orange, compared, say, to task four. Orange is a tightly constrained task, which we would call a problem-solving task. Task four is an open design task. 
And you don't need to be a statistician to see there are big differences. And as always, we like to compare different... These are all professionals, at least 10 years design experience, mechanical engineers, industrial designers, and we can see this quite also differences there. Right? Now, since I presume most people here are industrial designers, product designers, yes? Raise your hand. No reason. Yeah. Okay. We know there's very few mechanical engineers. So there's something very interesting here. The maximum activation for mechanical engineers is a lot lower than for industrial designers. Why could that be? Why is it? Well, there's two explanations, at least, depending on whether you're a mechanical engineer or an industrial designer. If you're a mechanical engineer, the explanation is, well, we're just more efficient. We need less effort than industrial designers. Of course, if you're an industrial designer, the explanation is mechanical engineers are lazy and don't put enough effort in. We have no idea. I, I don't think either of those explanations is, is real. But what we are finding is that there are these fundamental differences in the way in which humans respond. This is functional near infrared spectroscopy. That is, it shines an infrared light into your brain. We measure the reflectance, and that tells us about what's happening in terms of blood flow, or more in, precisely, oxygen. So, this gives you all sorts of intriguing things. So, we teach different design methods. Uh, so, here's brainstorming. And what are we showing here? Left brain, right brain activation. Okay, and what we see here is in brainstorming, we see a lot more left brain activation to start with. And this is time across the horizontal axis. All right, so we take the design session, divide it into 10 called deciles, plot up the distribution of activation between left and right brain. That's what we see. When we press this many times, nothing happens. At least I get some exercise. Um, this is morphological analysis. Morphological analysis is a, what we would call a semi-structured design method. What you do is you take some sticky notes and you put ideas down, and then you locate them in a spectrum of where they're going to fit. And what we see there is in morphological analysis, you get a different brain behavior. It's not just sort of, oh, here's a different design method. We saw different behavior in the mind, but now we actually are measuring what's happening right at the substrate, <coughs> what's happening in the brain. The third method, has anyone here heard of TRIZ? Okay. Yeah, boy, that's, a, that's more than I, thank you, more than I expected. TRIZ is the acronym in Russian for inventing machine. And it's the only design method ever to come out of the Soviet Union that's used in the West. And probably where you are, it's used in the motor car and aerospace industry. It's a very different kind of method. And the brain responds very differently. Now, this is foundational work. Normally, we don't think of designers and you know, doing research into what designers do as being foundational. Now, we teach all kinds of thinking tools, of which those are some, by the way. 
But one of the things that in common use, uh, it's got different names, but concept maps. Concept maps, there's nothing sophisticated about them. You put a little bubble with an idea, and then you connect it to the, the other ideas. They have multiple connections. So what this does, which is a little different to brainstorming and morphological analysis and quiz, it offloads cognition. Beautiful term, what does it mean? Offloading cognition is when you don't have to keep thinking about it because you're putting it outside you. So you're offloading that, and then you can bring it back. Now, as designers, we're familiar with this because that's what sketching is. Sketching offloads cognition. But, got to be careful with the claim about sketching. If you want to see something truly interesting, you should read a paper of mine called To Sketch or Not to Sketch. That is the question. Which shows, well, you should read the paper. So, um, here we are. This is what your brain looks like. This is, you know, 15, 20 people. If you're just brainstorming, this is called a heat map. The more red it is, the more active that part of the brain is. The more blue it is, the less active that part of the brain is compared to when you start. It. It's not just less active, right? And orange, you have no blue in this. The orange is sort of blue. If you use it, concept map, of which an example is on the right, it changes the way you work. It shifts completely which regions of the brain are used. I mean, before we produced this, no one had ever seen anything like this. It's really okay. So let, let's. What does Chat GPT do? Right? Does it rot your brain? Well, not a. It's not a scientific term. So let's use a scientific term. Does it Chat GPT reduce cognitive load? Yes. yes, dramatically. So yes. I'm just thinking about the constraints. Yeah. Left, no chat GPT, a lot of activity across the, uh, you know, we can talk more technically across the prefrontal cortex here. With chat GPT, it's a big dramatic reduction. Of course, with chat GPT, is a whole can of worms. It's not, you know, it's not a simple statement. And when I'm actually coming up with ideas, I'm offloading it more and more onto chat GPT. I don't know if this is the definition of rotting your brain or not, but what it is very clearly is offloading. What the implication of that is, we don't yet know. And maybe we won't know for a long time. Because this is going to change the way you use your brain. <clears throat> that is not bad because that's what education does. Right? The purpose of education is to change the way you use your brain. So when I say chat GP is going to change the way you use your brain, that's not an unusual statement to make just sounds over for us because the GPTs have hit us very fast. So designing is rich, very rich. So you know, when you read the design brief, which part of the brain are you using? Just reading is already part of design. 
In fact, all the studies show that if I tell you I'm going to give you a design brief, you already start designing, even though you don't know what it is. Fascinating, right? Okay, if, as I start framing the problem, I'm using different parts of my brain. When I'm looking at how I'm going to do things, and then finally when I'm right, coming up with ideas must be very hard, because this is the last one in this. So we can see that how there's this flow of idea, flow of brain activations. And this says something, I, I, I don't know if there's any neuroscientists uh, in the audience, I, I'm giving a talk as part of a colloquium tomorrow uh, to neuroscientists. This is foreign territory to neuroscientists, because they study one thing. Design is not one thing. Okay, this is whole brain scanning, lots of new stuff here. We had to invent new ways of doing things. So we're doing brain scans while people are talking and sketching. All right? And <coughs> you remember our uh, function behavior structure? Well, it turns out function behavior structure, which by the way um, was developed 35 years ago, has a it seems to have a neurophysiological basis. I don't know how well you can see, but there's little red dots to show you. And those are in a different place to behavior, which are in a different place to structure. So let's finish off with, now that we know more about what's happening in the brain, apart from having a lot of fun, and can we do something with this? Well, we can certainly do something. I once proposed when I was at MIT that instead of doing final exams and final projects, we just should do a final brain scan. <laughs> uh, not everyone will. I've got to say. Uh, anyway, um, so here's this idea. The idea is very simple. We show you which part of your brain is most active when you're coming up with ideas. We show you this heat map. Exactly this, right? Put it up in the corner of the screen. And while you're designing, we say, keep that red part red. That's it. No theory, no neuroscience. Nothing. It's a fundamental part of the way humans self-regulate, which is they can make things happen to themselves without any idea of how it happens. Which, by the way, is what, what learning is. You have no idea how you're learning, but you're learning. Okay. So here's the idea. And what happens? Firstly, we see major changes in brain activity. And, you know, you can go through all this, but the big thing is compare the right and left. Each, each horizontal band is one person. Right? And what is the effect of this? It produces double the number of ideas. We've done this now with hundreds of people, students, practitioners, sales, people in medical devices. No. Incredible, right? How it's possible to change you, not after four years of education. So, I want to finish off with, this is part of a much bigger endeavor when you're doing research into design thinking. Right? 
And I've mentioned a little bit about design cognition, and we did this sort of black box experiment, which was the first one, and protocol analysis. I didn't talk at all about physiology, but we measure a lot about your body. Uh, just your pupil dilation tells us something. Your heart rate chain, heart rate variability. You probably don't know, but your skin is a conductor and your skin resistance as electrical uh, medium changes all the time. We can measure that in coral. I didn't talk about that. And I talked about this. So let me finish with the following. Firstly, these are really nice people. Uh, to give you some, you have seen the results of many, many millions of dollars of research that has been funded. But what this shows is that there's a whole world here. And I haven't even talked about something which we will hit us and is starting to hit us more, which is brain-computer interaction. <laughs> The cost of some of these measurements is low. The device is under $1,000 US. Not fMRI, which is under $2 million, just. But the others, relatively low. As we know more, so we can begin to think about how we might use that. We don't know yet how we might use this knowledge. And there's a lot more knowledge to be generated. But we're at a point now where this sort of threshold, there's, there's this opportunity that's going to flood us. And what I want you to go away from this talk is, hmm, there may be something here. If you take more than that, even better. And if you want to see this stuff in writing, um, johngiro.com or if you are too lazy to type that in <laughs> so let me stop there Hello, sir. My question is, as you showed us using chat GPT for the uh, lesser cognitive load, so is it possible that uh, using chat GPT, as we know, it's all about the association or synapses between the neurons. So if this cognitive overload is going down, this can uh, cause loss of connections or synapses in our brain. I, the answer to that is a very clear no. And let me explain why very quickly. Can you multiply two four-digit numbers together in your head now? Probably not, right? Yet this was something, when I was a high school student, we were expected to be able to multiply two three-digit numbers together. And there were many people who said, look, with these calculators, that's going to be the end of people doing work in their brains. Not at all. What it's going to do is free cognitive. So it's going to give you a cognitive surplus. It's the opposite of what you think. Now, what you do with that, another matter if you go spend your time on the beach, Nothing wrong with that, but, you know, that's one possibility. You could, of course, produce better designs. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'm a enthusiast, and it was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Can I start? 
This raises a different kind of question, I feel, which is that if you look at the brain of a violinist, you will find that her spatial reasoning and the size of that in the brain is much larger than most people's. Because a violinist needs to be able to get to exactly that point. Right? Now, the question is, did they start with a larger region that, that is a higher potential, or is that produced as a result of exercise? The same applies here. We don't know whether people who are good at something, and I, I have a lot of children, I don't know how big I have. I have seven children and 15 grandchildren. Right, so I have an experimental lab. <laughs> well, I can tell you, you know, by the six months, you, you will really see things in terms of the way individual individualization falls. And by the time you know, a child is three, you can see whether they're good at sketching. It doesn't mean that they'll become an artist. So there's no answer to that question because we don't know enough. What I know is that if we are able to find out more and more, we can do something which I haven't talked about at all, and it's not my field, which is to go back and see if there's a genetic basis. Because now we know enough, and we have the capability to actually look at individuals' genome and see whether, in fact, there is isolatable some gene structure which correlates with right? that. I've actually built computer models of that because we've applied it to designs. It's called genetic engineering. And if you look down my publications, you will find how that's done. But you know, that's a long way off to do it in, with humans. Yes. The people with microphones have run away. <laughs> well, anyone who's got a microphone is in charge. Yes. So I would just like to probe you a little bit more on how do you design experiments which gave us these graphs. You went over them briefly, but I was really interested in how do you design such social experiments and what is the thinking behind uh, like how do you know what like if you know what you want to get from the experiment from, from the beginning of the experiment or you sort of evolve to find out what you actually get from the experiment? How do you design this A really good question, and you will not find enough of this in the literature. Right. It's very, firstly, it's very hard to design, unless we use the word design, to design experiments involving humans. Why? Because humans are ornery. I don't think that's a word ornery. Humans are not completely predictable. They're not just not predictable, they do things that you don't want them to do, which destroys the experiment. Uh, by the way, if you want to learn a bit more about the fun of this, there is a beautiful book called Predictably Irrational. If you haven't read it, it's really, it's a great read. It tells you a lot about yourself. There's another great book, by the way, called Thinking Fast and Slow. Another easy read. Um, the end gets a bit boring. Um, so don't tell. Uh, 
so I can't answer your question in less than many hours, right? Um, but there is a, a very nice book called Designing Neuroscience Experiments by Mary Haggerty, I think, Haddington. But the title is about right. Look it up, I don't know if it's Amazon, that's my source for library information. Um, it talks about fMRI, but it starts with, and you can forget about the fMRI part, it starts with how do you find a research question? It's all the way through to the yeah. how do you present emotions, which is a great thing if you're a student. The answer is you have to think before you act. And you have to do that many times. Because there's a, in experimental work, there's something called confounding variables. And these are variables that you didn't take account of, which destroy the results. Right? So, I mean, I, I, I was on a committee just recently who were looking at um, chat GPT and recommender systems, computer programs, that, you know, Amazon users and others. And they've done this big study with over a thousand people. But they didn't ask the question, how many books have you read in the last year? Right? So when we did, got them to do it, I was on the other side of it. So we asked them to do a pilot study to repeat it, but now asking people. But it turns out a lot of the responders don't read <laughs> at all. You know, apart from their little students, apart from their yeah, textbooks. So that, that would be a confounding variable. And there's a lot of them. Enormous numbers. That, so you, you need think, think, think. Uh, pilot, pilot, pilot. Right? Anyone who goes from, oh, I'm going to do this experiment and I do it without testing it is probably doing it. So, does this cognitive load also vary about how the person, how much the person is seasoned or experienced in a particular field? Not in the way you might expect. Um, there is a paper published in 1956 or 1957, which was the most, one of the most important papers in cognitive science, published about the time cognitive science was in then, published by George Miller. And it's got a, the best title you could ever imagine for a scientific paper. It's called The Magic Number 7 Plus or Minus 2. What a great title for the paper. And what he showed was that human short-term memory could only deal with seven plus or minus two independent chunks of thought. Uh, you've got to be careful, you know, chunk is a technical word and so on. Uh, our experience is that number has dropped over in the last 70 years, down to about certainly five plus or minus two. Um, it, you know, maybe what people said about television and computers is correct, or maybe that's just human evolution. So, having said that, professionals, and I only know about designers, I can't tell you about other people, professional designers never <laughs> go above seven chunks of activity. Often they're down at the three to five. Students are up around 17 or 30. They're swamped cognitively. Their productivity is very low compared to a professional. But, and there's a really big but here, students produce ideas that are ranked 
or rated or classified as more creative than professionals. Now there's another one. But they don't know that. <laughs> oh. Professionals are really good at assessing whether where they're going is going to lead to somewhere interesting. And students have zero idea. So the answer is, your question can't be directly answered because it, it should be framed differently, but it provokes this answer. Yeah, hello. So uh, nowadays there is another term which is metacognition. So now when you ask this uh, uh, experiment, the subjects that keep uh, your thinking in that red zone. So uh, are you, so is it a type of metacognition and then uh, are you working on metacognition of the designers and uh, does it actually plays an important role now in communication? Um, the answer to one part of it is I don't think that's metacognition at all. Because it's not really cognition. It's some behavioral response. Okay? Because they don't know what they're doing. They just have no idea that uh, they're making it. The answer is metacognition is profoundly important. Um, sometimes, you know, metacognition appears in other ways, like strategy versus tactics. Strategy is meta-tactics and stuff like um, We have done work recently on metacognition, but part of metacognition that I'm particularly interested in is an area in design which now goes under the name of framing. How do you decide to look at something that affects what it is for you? And this is part of another area of cognition called situated cognition. Now, situated cognition says that cognition isn't just here, it's here in the interactions between what's in your mind, your body, and the external world. So, and let me give you an example of how the meaning of things isn't in the thing. So if I point it to somebody, and I won't, because I'm going to ask the wrong question. Um, if you want to make it. Get undressed. Firstly, that in this environment, I would hope is profoundly disturbing and clearly doesn't fit. Right? But if, if I'm sitting behind my desk and you come in, and you say, look, doctor, I have this rash all over me. And I say, get undressed. That's very reasonable. So it can't be the words, get undressed. It's got to be the situation you're in. And in designing, there's a difference between situation and framing, but they're tightly connected. The way you think of something. So if you decide, for example, to include sustainability, that changes things. And if you don't even think about it, it's not there. If you decide um, that you're going to work harder than you're paid for for this client, because you really want to impress them because you might get more work, that changes what you do. So the way you frame things is actually dominant. And you're constantly framing them and reframing them. And that's what makes design interesting. That you can't at the beginning say where you'll end up. Now, because a lot of design, you can say. You know, you're going to take this widget and you're going to tweak it a bit. And that's all, you know, that's a lot of design. Right? I mean, I've seen an extraordinary number um, as we all have, water bottles over the last 10 or 20 years, and they've become popular. Most of them look like this. Different ribbing, slightly different shape, unless you're Coca-Cola, which is, maintains the 1930s shape. So 
you know, that's not that kind of design. But, you know, this kind of design that we want to aspire to is designs that change the world in some way. And we don't know where the end is. We know what sort of where it is, but not all of it. And there's really interesting things about that distinction between designing and problem solving. And what we're doing as we design is we reframe as we go along, depending on what we see as we do it. And we're beginning to catch it. There's a question down here. Well, possession is nine tenths of the question. So, do we have any one mic? Okay. So, uh, good evening. First of all, thank you so much for the insightful session. Uh, so, my question to you was that uh, we were talking about the FPS uh, ontology. So, in uh, complex systems, there is often a need for uh, such as AI uh, or you know, autonomous vehicles. So, uh, how does this FPS ontology actually uh, um, create a gap between uh, what could be the expected behavior out of the fast outcomes of learning and you know uh, some unexpected behaviors because of some external factors? Is there any methodology to be bridging the gap between the same more effectively? Okay, then the way that is normally handled it depends whether you're talking about. I mean, this, the idea is the same. That's why we have in the FBS ontology, we have a process called evaluation. And the evaluation is the process that compares expected behavior with actual behavior. And when they're different, then you have to reform. And the question is, where do you reformulate? And there's three fundamental places you can. The most common way is you change the structure. The structure are the elements of their relationships. Right? So you make something bigger, make something smaller. You change the material so it's stronger. You change it so it's, <coughs> you change the shape. In software, it's exactly the same idea, except you're not working with molecules. You're working with instructions. The second is you change the behavior. I mean, this is a very common approach in design. Here's the specification. <coughs> Turns out you don't need it all. Very common. But that, so let me just finish. And then there's the third one, which is function. And that's where the function and behavior is where things like autonomous vehicles end up in showing you that you need more. Not more structure, but how you go from behavior to structure. So when there's a gap, you either change the behavior or something which is very hard to do computationally is you add a behavior. And that's the most interesting one. Because what that shows is that you miss something. And that's where I would work in that domain. Is how do you find behaviors that weren't there? Just stand up and yell. Thank you for a wonderful talk. And I think there are a few of the intangibles like software and instructions and other things which are easy to, to tweak around with the, and their behavioral effects are very different from when you do small changes in tangible effects. I would say that ontologically in FBS ontology, 
the epistemology is indistinguishable. The exhibition of it, of course, will be different. But it is different all over the place. But from the ontological view, they're exactly the same. And we, uh, I used to do a lot of consulting. Um, and for me, I, I did consulting across the spectrum in the design world, where we design frameworks for software and so on, in exactly the same way as we did for, we work with architects. That's a sort of superficial answer. So I have one question. Uh, since you have studied so much about brain science activities and how how to uh, stabilize working in one, in any of the environment, so have you able to change or develop uh, any habits habits like good or bad good or bad habits in your like research life? Like if your brain if you are focusing on red zone, then you should be doing this idea. Any sort of experiment you have done on your team or any habit? <laughs> Try to, let me just make sure I understood the question. Are you asking about me, or are you asking about the field? What I'm do asking, I do? I'm asking about you. That since you have studied so much about brain and activities, how, activities, how does it work? So, have you able to integrate any of the results in your life, in a broad sense or a normal sense? Interesting question. Yeah. I give a lot of lectures, and that's the first time I've heard a question I haven't come across before. Right? Um, the answer is, as you get older, and I am older than you, in case there's some doubt. <laughs> as you get older, you get wiser. What does wiser mean? It means you can bring things together you can see things that other people perhaps can't see. Um, and I think that's very hard to do research on. Um, at, at the level that I do, maybe at the brain sort of neuroscience level, it may be possible. I mean, the problem is we can't isolate individual thought. Therefore, it's very hard to be able to answer some important questions. And even some things which you think we have, actually you don't have. I don't have ever seen uh, networks of brains, brain activity. Not neural networks, the computational view, but the actual ones uh, that come out of neuroscience. It'll come as a shock, perhaps, that those are not things that people measure in the brain. Those are fabrications. They're made, I'm using the word fabrication here. They're constructed, not measured. They're constructed when it says, this region of the brain and this region of the brain coactivate. So therefore, we've, they must be connected in some way. So brain networks are not what you think at all. And I mention that because we're, we're not ready yet to answer your question. Right? That's not a satisfactory answer, but not everything in life gets satisfactory answers. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to close the session. I can tell you that any amount of time spent with Mr. Zero, Thank you so much for the <laughs> 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 Oh, thank you very much.
You look for women in person. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to all of you for being here. And before we close the session, if you still have questions, please come from the phone. I'm easy to contact. I don't guarantee the answer. But I'm not better. The, the rule is if you don't hear from me in 48 hours, sorry. You know, I, I may get, I probably get more email than any of you. But I, I am, if you have, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm serious, please send them to me. And could you also tell me you know how we came across each other <laughs> right because you know i give a lot of talks and, and so on and i'm never you know if you tell me you must remember me i asked the second question well you know maybe not <laughs> but i won't remember you if you say you know it's like talking about the book and it was in your mind